So the difference between Agile and Waterfall comes up all the time. And some people prefer Waterfall and some people prefer Agile. Really what we're trying to do is to get a project across the line. And so today I wanted to talk about the difference between Waterfall and Agile project plans and the different tools that we're going to be using in each of those project plans. So the differences, but also how they are the same. Now, the thing about this is we don't get a free pass on our project just because it's Agile or just because it's waterfall, we still have to go through and manage each of these items from the scope, the stakeholders, the schedule, the cost, the quality, all of these things we still have to manage as we're delivering a new product. All right, let's get into the differences between Agile and Waterfall project management plans. And we're going to start right at the top where we start in a normal project. We usually do that with a business case where we come up with the business case to figure out the pros and cons of starting this new product or delivering this new product. We start with a project charter as well. So our project charter down here where we uh, get the official kickoff of our project from the project sponsor. So we get resources and funding. We might have a change control plan where we outline our change control approach. Usually that will have to go to a change control board when we're making changes on our project. So we outline all these things early on in a waterfall project. The configuration management plan for version control. So how are we keeping versions of our system under control? benefits management plan, and ultimately the project management plan that we plan up front with our scope, schedule, and cost, quality, and all of those things, usually in our triple constraint of scope, schedule, cost, and quality in the middle there. So all of those things we have to manage, and we plan that all the way up front. But what does that look like on an agile project? Well, there's a few different ways that we can kick off an agile project. And the really all of those documents are sort of replaced by a team charter and a high level model. So we have a high level model of the system and what it will look like or what it currently looks like. Uh, that can be done with a sequence diagram or some sort of architecture diagram usually. Um, we can also use a, a walking skeleton, which is just a bare bones version of the system that we already have in place that we can then add features to. Now there's a few other ways in Agile and it's a bit more light on, so less of this big planning up front, but we can also use a business model canvas or a lean canvas, lean canvas business plan, where we're talking about what the customer, what the problem is that we're trying to solve, the solution that we're coming up with, and how are we delivering value? So who is our customer? What's our unfair advantage? Uh, what are the channels that we're delivering through? So this is just a good way of planning out and making sure it's basically like a business case. And we could use that to plan out features that deliver value to our customer on an agile project because it is more customer focused. It's really about the customer in an agile project. Now, once we've done that, we still have to gather stakeholders and we still have to do that, whether it's agile or whether it's waterfall, but waterfall is a little bit more involved. We might get our stakeholder register and we outline all of the stakeholders that we know who are going to be involved in our project. We might uh, classify them by their stakeholder influence on our project and the impact that we're going to have on their area. And we also might do things like stakeholder engagement. So who is the most engaged? Are they currently unaware, but, and we desire them to be supportive, for example. And here are our classifications for stakeholders. Do they have a high influence and a high impact? Then we're probably going to need to uh, communicate quite a lot with those particular stakeholders. So there's a lot of planning up front. We can still use that in Agile, but again, in uh, in more of your Agile projects, it's a little bit uh, less documented. So less documents that we're going through. Again, we might use our team charter, which has our high level vision or mission, the background of the project, then the team roles and stakeholders that we're going to work with, and the team values, and then how we deal with uh, communication and conflict and decision-making on our project. We just plan that out. How do we want to work together as a team? And also we just co-locate our team. So we have a small team who ha has all of the skills that we need to get the job done, usually around nine, no more than nine people, sometimes up to 12, but the smaller, the better, a two pizza team, I think they used to call it. Um, so around three to nine people is ideal. And we co-locate those people so we can all uh, communicate and work together quickly. So 
Again, a little bit lighter on an agile project, but still very people focused. And we still have to plan that out and say, this is the way we're going to be managing the stakeholders. So once we've got our stakeholders, we want to gather the requirements from those stakeholders. Maybe it's our customer, maybe it's our project sponsor, maybe it's a senior user, but we still need to gather the requirements for what we're delivering. And in a waterfall project, what are we going to do? We might use a, re a requirements documentation. It's like a big document, so a big requirements document. Uh, maybe it's got all of the details written out really detailed. Um, we could also use the requirements traceability matrix, which has all of the requirements uh, that the customers want, and then how they match up to the scope and the test cases and where they're currently, what their current status is. So it traces those requirements to their completion as we go through the project. Uh, now, funnily enough, with Agile for illicit requirements, there's more things that we can do. So Agile is more focused on people, but also customer requirements. So meeting the needs of our customers. So we, there's sort of more things that we can do here. We can go back and use the business model canvas or the lean model canvas. Uh, to come up with new feature ideas to make sure that they're meeting our customer needs. We can also use things like the net promoter score for customer satisfaction. So are our customers satisfied? Are they giving us feedback? Can we take that feedback and turn that into requirements and uh, turn that into requirements that we can then deliver uh, for improvements? We can also start with the high level model uh, or the model of where we're trying to go with our system. So how is it? To, and again, this is an architecture diagram, uh, a sequence diagram. There are a few different ways to do this. We could actually use prototypes or mockups or storyboards to show how it's actually going to look. And that's a really nice way to do it. We can also, uh, with when we're eliciting requirements, we might just go straight into test cases and acceptance criteria. So as a particular user, what are the actions that we want to get this particular goal? That's use cases. Or given when then is our behavior driven development way of writing out test cases. And we might put those on our requirements user stories. So as you can see, it's more focused on real things. So prototypes, uh, but also focused on quality and testing, focused on people and ultimately focused on the customer from an agile point of view. All right, now we've got requirements but now we want to turn those requirements into the scope and deliverables for our project. So what do we do on a waterfall project? Well, we're going to have our high level scope description, just a written scope statement, usually a sentence or a paragraph. And we break, break that down into a high level list of features and the exclusions, what's out of scope. Then we prioritize those things. So we might prioritize them using different methods. Moscow is one way, uh, cost benefit is another way, uh, the cost of delay is another way. There's many different uh, ways to prioritize things and we're going to use a similar approach in Agile. Work breakdown structure, so we take those high level features and we break those down into smaller items until they're broken down into the activities or tasks that we're going to complete. Uh, in order to deliver those items. That's our work breakdown structure. We're breaking it down, decomposing those items to their smallest level. The work breakdown structure dictionary or WBS dictionary adds more items to our work packages. So those small level items, now we're adding resources, the cost of those items, the, uh, the, uh, any dependencies of those items and how long they might take the duration of those items. So that fills out all of that information. Again, we're doing a lot of that planning up front, and ultimately we've got a work packages list. A work package is the smallest level on our work breakdown structure that someone or a team or a person can work on and complete and deliver. So all of that planning up front, what have we got from an agile perspective? Well, when we're managing and creating scope, we want to start with our product backlog. And a product backlog over here could be a list of epics, which is our high level features or high level ideas that we then break down into user stories over here. So we've got our epics or maybe the products or the features that we're delivering. And it depends on how you want to break this down. That's usually the way that they fit. Epics will break down into a bunch of user stories, maybe 10 or 20 or 30 user stories. And those are the user stories that we complete during a sprint. And so we, we do that. That's similar to our work breakdown structure where we're breaking down the deliverables into work packages that someone can work on. 
So very, very similar stuff. We're going to use mockups and storyboards uh, for our scope to show people what it's going to look like. User story mapping is another way of decomposing the item. So this is where we walk through the system from start to finish and what are the features that we're adding. So if we're in a bank, bank app, for example, checking the account balance, uh, what do we want to do there? Then we break it down. What are the steps? Logging in, access our accounts, and what are the details of those steps? So we enter a username, enter a password, press the login button, and those are the things that we want to be delivering in our user stories, in the things that we can deliver during a sprint. We prioritize those items from the product backlog, and also in our user stories, we can prioritize those by cost or benefit, value or effort, and again, many different ways to prioritize particular items. At the end of our scope, we accept that scope once it's been completed with the sprint review. So at the end of the two weeks, uh, we showcase and demonstrate what we've created to the customer, and the customer says, hey, that's exactly what I wanted, or uh, maybe we missed something here, or it's not quite what I had in mind. And, but that way we get that real feedback. Again, more focused on people and customer requirements. Okay, now that we've got scope, now we can put that to a schedule. When can we deliver that scope? In Waterfall, how do we do it? Well, we get that scope and we break it down into an activity list. So we've got our scope deliverable. What are the activities that we need to do to deliver that deliverable? So we've got our project activity list. Then we put those activities on a, we sequence them. So when do they need to be, what order do they need to be completed in? And ultimately we estimate their durations. So how long are they going to take? Many different ways to estimate, bottom-up estimating, parametric estimating, uh, three-point estimating that you'll find in the PMBOK guide. And lastly, we create the schedule itself, which often looks like a Gantt chart. So we've got our deliverables and here is when we're going to be delivering them. Now, from an agile point of view, we have what we call the product roadmap, which looks suspiciously like a project schedule. <laughs> so it's very much the same, if not exactly the same, can be a Gantt chart. So here's our feature, here's our next feature, next feature. When are we delivering those features? Now, it doesn't have to be a schedule, it could just be a list. So the ordered list, the sequenced list, but again, very similar to our waterfall approach. We're also going to do sprint planning. So how many of these uh, user story cards can we fit in a sprint that's going to match with the amount of work that we can complete in that sprint? So that's our sprint planning. If we can complete 50 points in a sprint, then we can potentially put 50 points in the next sprint. Maybe that's five points per card, so we can put 10 cards or 10 user story cards. That's our sprint planning. So we've got our sustainable pace. We're matching it to the velocity, how fast we can do the work. Planning poker is how we do our estimation where everyone estimates uh, and maybe we say someone says one story point, someone says three, someone says five, someone says eight. The, the lowest and the highest discuss their reasons for doing it then we all estimate again until we come to a consensus. And maybe we end up with a three or a five in the middle there somewhere. Burn up and burn down charts is how we track our schedule in Agile. We have, let's say here, we've got 70 user story points over our sprint, and we're going to complete that on an ideal trend, but here's how we're actually tracking. So that's our burn down chart, and maybe some bits get added, and then maybe at the end we complete them all, or maybe we don't finish them by the end of the sprint but that's our burn down chart to track our schedule. Now that we've got scope and schedule, we can start looking at the cost of our project. And this is great because in Waterfall, we're going to estimate the work packages. We've got our work packages over here, the deliverables, uh, and, and as we said, the things that people can actually work on and create and deliver. How much are we going to, how much are they going to cost? We need to estimate those things. Contingency and management reserves, contingency reserves for our risks, and management reserves for any unforeseen scope. And ultimately that gives us our approved baseline budget that's approved. And then if we make any changes to that, it needs to go through our change control process. So the change management plan that we were talking about. But on Agile, we just have a fixed cost. So let's say it's a million dollars and that's a, a fixed, stable, small team of around nine people, as we were saying, keep it nice and small and they just work for as long as that million dollars lasts. Maybe it's six months, maybe it's a year. 
uh, and they deliver as many features as they can from the product backlog. And that product backlog uh, gets prioritized by the product owner and they want to deliver the highest value items first. So highest value, highest value, highest value until they run out of time and run out of money. And then the project ends. But on Agile, it's a fixed cost. So it keeps it nice and easy. Now that we've got scope, schedule, cost, we can start looking at quality. How do we manage quality on a waterfall project? We use our test and inspection plan. We test our, we've got our deliverables and what are the test criteria that we're going to test those deliverables. So how are we going to make sure that they meet the customer's quality requirements? Do they pass? Do they fail? Usually we do those tests right at the end once all of our scope has been delivered. So sometimes we do all of that work and then we do the testing and then we find something wrong and we have to go all the way back to the beginning and do more of that work to deliver that all over again. But from an agile perspective, we're doing small increments. So we're testing as we're going every single one, testing and delivering, testing and delivering. So there's no need to go back. It's all encompassed in the one little feature or the one little deliverable. We also use for quality things like code inspections. So we're pair programming or pairing up uh, or side by side programming or just shoulder checking the code or checking the code before it is uh, accepted and goes into uh, one of the environments for us to test. We can also use things like test driven development where we write our tests before we start work. So on our user story card, which is the thing that we're going to create our little deliverable, just like our work package, we can start out saying, uh, and this is behavior driven development or BDD as a uh, consultant, uh, then I want a sales button, for example, and uh, so that I can make a sale or send an email or whatever that looks like. So that's the requirement and that's what we're going to test uh, against on that user story to make sure that it is accurate and complete. We're also gonna do things like um, unit testing for each of our user story cards. We're gonna test each of them with test-driven development usually. Release planning, so we'll plan for our feature releases uh, and the sprint review at the end of our two weeks we're going to review those increments and those things that we've delivered with our customer to quality check them with our customer and make sure that they are what they wanted. Now, of course, on any project, we still have to manage the resources on our project. And so we don't get a free pass. On Agile, we still have to manage it. On Waterfall, we still have to manage the resources. So we need to estimate the resources required. Again, we can estimate those for the deliverables that we're delivering up here, the scope. And we might use three point estimating, analogous estimating, which is something similar, like a similar feature. We might use parametric estimating, which is a parameter like $100 per hour, for example, or $50 per meter, for example. That's a parameter. Many different ways to estimate. Uh, we've got our resource breakdown chart or structure. This shows our the resources on our project. Where do they fit? Maybe we've got the uh, testers over here, maybe we've got developers over here, maybe we've got business analysts over here, and here they all are in the team. So that's our resource breakdown structure. And then we've got our RACI or our resource assignment matrix that we're going to use. This shows us all of the different people and what are they responsible for? What tasks or deliverables are they responsible for on the project? What do they do? What's their role and responsibility? The resource calendar shows us things. So when are our days off and when are our holidays and all of these things that are going to impact the time on our project. And of course, back to our classic team charter, what's the way of working for our team? How do we manage conflict? How do we manage decisions? Who are the stakeholders that we're working with and what are our values? So those are the things that we're going to use. And funnily enough, we use that on our Agile project as well. So nice team charter, great way to do it. With our Agile, again, it's more people focused and people centered. So we're going to use things like the whole team approach. This means we bring everyone we need to complete the features, we bring them into our team. And those people, we want them to be T-shaped people uh, or generalizing specialists. So they have many different skills and many different uh, ideas uh, and, and talents, but then one deep specialty. So maybe that's developing, for example. 
but they've also got a little bit of design, maybe a little bit of testing, maybe a little bit of business acumen. So the, that's what we want on our people. Wide range of skills, but one deep specialty. We want to co-locate that team so that everyone is in the same area, easy to talk to, easy to get answers. We want an information radiator, which is visual management, so everyone can see what we're working on and where it's up to. And also pair, pair programming or side-by-side -side programming, pair programming from XP or side-by-side -side programming from Crystal, similar ideas, working together, and that just sort of helps people focus. And there's various things behind that. Uh, maybe one person is coding, the other person is looking at the strategy behind it and looking at ways to improve while we're working together. Now on our project, we might have to manage vendors and procurements, probably uh, more to do with a, a waterfall project, many different vendors. On an agile project, we want to bring everyone into the same team, of course. So we might do a make or buy analysis. Is it better for us to make it or to buy it from a vendor? And what's the ongoing cost of that as well? We're going to use things like the uh, source selection criteria for our vendors. How do we choose our vendors? The qualified sellers list. So we might have existing sellers in our organization that we can choose from. Uh, the statement of work is just the list of the deliverables that we want them to deliver. Independent estimates from maybe commercial databases, just to make sure that we're not you know, that we're actually getting a good deal, that it's the right price for the marketplace to check that against. And we can make our decision on the vendor that we choose with multi-criteria decision analysis. So what is the criteria that we're choosing them against? What are the vendors that we're choosing? And uh, which ones fit those that criteria the best? Many different ways to do this, many different tools. Procurements can make uh, a lot more work on projects, so just be aware of that. But in an agile project, we're going to do a few different things differently. Uh, so we, with our contracts, we could do pay per feature. So our contract might just be it's X amount per feature, and we deliver those features until our money runs out on a fixed cost. We can also use fixed cost variable scope. So our scope might change. For example, this scope might come out uh, and this scope might come in and the contract remains the same amount of money, maybe whatever that is, a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, ten million dollars, a hundred million dollars. Uh, but we prioritize the highest value scope uh, to always be delivered until that money runs out. So fixed cost, variable scope, just like a normal agile project. Now with all of this, we've got scope, schedule, the, re the stakeholders, the resources, any vendors. We're going to need to communicate with all of those people across the entirety of our project. And on a waterfall project, we might use things like a communication styles assessment and a communication management plan. So th this one, we just send out an assessment. How do our stakeholders prefer to be communicated with? Do they prefer reports? Do they prefer emails? Do they prefer a working group meeting? Do they prefer daily stand-ups? Maybe we want to work a bit of agile. What is that preference? And we uh, make sure that we try and meet that preference with our stakeholders. Now, from an agile point of view, it's more involved here because agile is all about communication, people, communication, and meeting those stakeholder needs, customer needs. So we want that open team area. So we've got our open team area with all of our uh, project information on the walls, visual management, so we can see where we're up to just by walking through our team area, nice and easy. But also the ceremonies. So the daily stand-up, the 15-minute session, so 15 minutes every day, we catch up as a team. How are you going? Is anything blocking you? What are we planning to deliver for the next stand-up? The retrospective, at the end of our two-week sprint, we catch up as a team and we say, what's working well? What's not working well? Uh, what, is, uh, what still puzzles us? And what did we learn? Uh, and so we'd look at all those things and we take that and we improve our process as we're going along. Sprint planning is how we plan our initial two-week sprint. So remember, we uh, take the 50 story points or however it is, however much it is that we can deliver. Uh, and we say, okay, we've got 50 story points worth of cards and we can put those into the next sprint so that it's a sustainable pace. We're not overloading our team, but we're not underwhelming them either. So it's sustainable. And then lastly, the sprint review where we're catching up as a team, demonstrating 
the real product that we've delivered during those two weeks to the customer so they can see, feel and touch it and make sure that it's on track. All right, now risk. We still have to manage risk. Whether it's waterfall or agile, it's the same thing. We, on a waterfall project, we're going to use a risk register, brainstorming risks with our team. We're going to uh, use things like risk categories, which is our risk breakdown structure. We might have technical risks, management risks, commercial risks, external risks, or any other category that you can come up with, and then brainstorming risks within those categories. So it's a nice way to do it. Risk definitions is how do we define the likelihood and the probability of those risks happening. So what does it mean to have a high probability? Well, maybe it's a 70% chance of happening, or maybe it's going to happen every uh, two days. Uh, so that's a high probability. How do we define that? Uh, and risks are also classified by probability and impact. And the highest risks are obviously with the highest risk, uh, highest probability and the highest impact if they do happen. So we don't get a free pass for risk, even if it's on an agile project. We still need to do it with our risk adjusted backlog. All we do, we still brainstorm those risks with our team but then we put them into our backlog and we prioritize those against the other work that we're doing. So if we've got these risks and something is really terrible that we need to get taken care of straight away, we're going to put that into our sprint uh, when we do our sprint planning. So now it's a risk adjusted backlog because we're tackling risk at the same time as we're delivering value. Pretty cool stuff. I like that. Uh, and lastly, of course, we still need to transition it to operations. Uh, and with Waterfall, once we've delivered everything uh, and we're handing it off to business as usual, we might use things like change management, organizational change management. So what's the change? What documentation do we need? What training do we need? Or what communication do we need to transition this back to the business that we're delivering for? But on an agile team, we don't really have documentation. Or, or we try not to, not a lot of it anyway. So how do we get around that? We, we use small features that we're just delivering incrementally so people would get used to it as they're going along quite simply. The customer is also already a part of the team and they can pass on that information to the other customers or the other senior users or the other parts of the business. And also we could use, just use good user experience or good UX design where it's easy to use and we don't need a high amount of documentation. So a little bit more work to design it well, but ultimately that's going to be better because we won't have as much documentation. And so all, those are all our 12 steps. The PM success steps, a wonderful way to do it. And as you can see, whether we're planning waterfall or whether we're planning agile, we still need to use certain tools. Some are more people focused and some are more documentation focused, but either way, we still have to manage all of these things as a project manager. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I've had an absolute blast and I'll see you in the next video.